Welcome to Masters of Modern. I'm your host, Alex Kessler, here with my co-host, not Ben Bateman. This is Michael Grothy. Hey, Masters of Modern fans. Uh, so today we're recording an episode uh, about awesome things. Uh, so recently, uh, in the last year, Wizards released something called Challenger Decks. And those were decks made for standard that replaced what used to be the event decks. And those were decks that were good for new players to pick up and then play in an FMM directly. Uh, when Wizards was making event decks, they also made a modern focused event deck. It was a black white tokens deck, and it was kind of a, a failure of a project, partly because just the price point that those event decks were, both for standard and modern, were always so low that it was hard to get real good cards in those decks. But Wizards has kind of revisited this as a subject for standard, and we're going to talk today a little bit about what that would look like if they revisited it for modern. We're going to go through the price points and kind of what the values in all those cards. The other thing we're going to be talking about today is uh, Michael Grothy uh, has a long experience of playing Scape Shift decks. He currently has have been playing Red Green Scape Shift, but he played every version of Rug, plus a yeah, little bit of that Bring the There light. was a period of time where blue-based Scape Shift decks were not very good, and I didn't really want to switch over to Red Green, and Scape Shape Shifts were very expensive, so I sold my Scape Shifts and used it to fund playing a different blue deck, which is Grixis Control, which is what I've been playing. But now that Scape Shifts are cheap, and they're kind of breaking back into the meta a little bit, I might, uh, I might yeah. pick some up. So we'll talk about that as well. And to kind of get into who Michael is, he is one of the game designers at Kesco. He was also one of the community organizers for the Santa Monica area. He managed uh, Heidi Who, uh, the store, that uh, actually, surprisingly, when we started playing, there are way more pros have come out of that store than, than I expected at the time. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good breeding ground for competitive magic. Like when I started at Heidi Ho, it was their very first tournament. It was a legacy tournament where the two people that ran the store at the time brought literally pre-con decks to the tournament. Another guy had six uh, demonic tutors in his deck and then a sideboard that he would tutor with that was of 400 cards. And then I showed up with Affinity. And so I that's played. either a really good deck or a really bad it deck. Was really it's bad. hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Six I, demonic tutors, 400 card sideboard that you're tutoring good. from yeah. might be good, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> another person had the, you know, the Naya, like uh, if you play a five drop red, green, white elf card that you like trigger. Well, yeah, it was playing like. You like draw an extra card on your upkeep. It was if like you a have six a five drop. drop. Yeah, something like that. Right, and he was right. playing like five of them as well. That's there are a lot good. of people that didn't understand the four card rule. Uh, I showed up with Affinity and my friend showed up with. Uh, Legacy Affinity, Leg right? With, Legacy Affinity with. with uh, Artifact Lands yes, and the whole nine years. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and my friend showed up with Legacy Miracles and. We, it was kind of, we like to describe it like if you ever watched Dragon Ball Z back in the day and they would do like the martial arts tournament and like all of these like regular humans would go to the tournament and they'd be like, I'm like the best martial artist on TV. And then like Goku would show up and he like had destroyed actual planets in the last episode <laughs> and they would fight each other and it felt like that. So Hideo has gone a long way from that moment to today where Andrew Brown, who works at Wizards, uh, Jules Robbins, who also works at Wizards, both yep. Heidi Ho alum, um, and then Andrew Brown's whole kind of testing group all kind of came out of that. And, yeah. and now Michael Hughes, who, who uh, top eight in a GP. He just top eight a GP yeah. with Fred Green Aldrazi, yeah. Is the current Michael, he, he's new Michael, Michael Hughes. Yeah, I mean, he's they worked, now running the magic yeah, there. <laughs> at Hideo. So check out Hideo Games. It's in Santa Monica. They just moved to by the Santa Monica Promenade. Um, and so, yeah, so you have an understanding of what it's like for a new player to kind of sign up for magic. and Yeah, I sold, a lot of, I sold a lot of event decks. Challenger decks were a little bit after my time uh, working at Heidi Ho. I had already started at Kess by that point, but, you know, I'm still in touch with people who run the shop, and so I kind of know a little bit about how to sell those types of products and what new players are looking for and what retailers are looking for. And right. Um, and beyond that, uh, we you know, want to let you guys know, because now it's time for the shout outs and advertising, now that we're told we're gonna talk about, uh, make sure to follow us on YouTube. Uh, so this video right now is being recorded on Facebook stream. Uh, if you joined it for the Facebook stream, you just got a bunch of intros twice because there was an audio problem halfway through the episode, which we'll get into a little bit more thoroughly in a second. Um, but you can watch this with good audio and other visual content on our YouTube channel. We're also releasing a special interview we did um, over the weekend that Ben did, so like Ben's not here now, but he has his own episode that he's releasing this week because, and then we also are releasing our uh, top 10 Demir cards on the podcast app. So you'll get multiple content this week, partly because last week we had an audio video quality issue. And so the video that's up there is low quality. And so we want to make The up legendary it. Demir top 10 podcast yeah. is coming out of the vault. Right. Well, that's because last week's episode, which was a episode about, uh, the most influential cards from each standard set and does yeah. standard sets affect modern. Uh, won't I was have watching, audio I was in the chat. Yeah, so that won't have audio release for last week, but we will have a, a 
podcast only exclusive episode and we'll have a we had that YouTube exclusive video and then we'll have two additional episodes this week uh, including this one so there'll be three video two videos this week that call come out and it'll be great and then I'm excited about this Ben Ben interview by the way yeah because I know who he interviewed and it's it's pretty exciting I, I think we can just tell the world I think we, we can we you don't want to keep it secret anymore I think well we're gonna release it this week okay yeah so it's Gavin Barry yeah inventor of modern he created the format works at Wizards yeah. Uh, he came down and played in a Highlander Roulette tournament and they had a bunch of fun and then Ben interviewed him about the creation of Modern and I haven't watched it so I don't know what else what they talk about so check that out. It's going to be awesome on the YouTube channel uh, this week. Make sure to subscribe um, and then we'll tweet it out everywhere and you'll find us if you find us on, follow us on Twitter at the MMCast. I'm Matt Cass Wiley. He doesn't really use it but it's at Dudder D-U-D-D-A-R-D. There's two Ds. I couldn't get I couldn't get only one D. Huh? You got double Ds on both at the Ds? End. At, at the, the end. end. So D-U-D-D-A-R-D-D. No, D U D A R D D. At that. But I I don't use Twitter much. If you want to find me, find me but in the Masters of Modern Facebook group. You can yell at him group. there. Yeah. If, <laughs> if you can find me in the Masters of Modern Facebook group, I'm active there. I check it regularly. Twitter is just like a content dump for me. Sure. I just like, that's where I find out what's going on in the world of magic and news and whatever. All right, sweet. So beyond that, let's talk about the episode. So, precon challenge deck. So, I guess, what is a precon? I'm going to interview you a little bit. Okay, so are we talking answers. about the, what the challenger decks are? Uh, what are precon and challenger decks in general? Like well, I mean, because is... every every preconstructed deck that Wizard puts out has different uh, a different purpose. So there's uh, like intro packs are you know a kid or or an adult walks into the shop and they have never played Magic before and they just how do I get started? So the shop can you know teach this person using welcome decks, uh, which are free that Wizards provides, and then after that, if they're like, okay, I kind of get this, then you can sell them an intro deck, and that just kind of has you know very basic stuff. Nowadays they come with planeswalkers. I believe they're called planeswalker decks, but I'm an old time shop guy, so I always call them intro decks. But um, so they have a planeswalker in the front. It's not a very good planeswalker, and basically. It's just getting used to the game, and you also get a Planeswalker, which is, which is an exciting card type, even if it's not very good. Um, the, next, the next level is the Deck Builder's Toolkit, which is not a pre-constructed deck, but it's just like a big bundle of cards. Now, you can soup up your intro deck using this big bundle of cards. You get a lot of cards for what you're paying. It's like 20 bucks, and you get like 200 commons plus four packs or something, so it's a pretty good deal, and a bunch of lands. So you can kind of build your own deck. Okay, now you're looking to go to FNM, is the next step. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have a product that bridged the gap between Deck Builders Toolkit and FNM for a long time, um, but you can use, you were supposed to use your Deck Builders Toolkit it up intro pack. wasn't wasn't that great, and you kind of needed to buy a lot of cards if you wanted to actually compete. But so the Challenger decks were designed by the new play design team, which uh, Andrew Brown, who you mentioned, is on, as well as mm -hmm. Paul Chion and Tom Ross and Melissa Dottora and a lot of like pro Magic players have gone on to work in play design. So they know what's good. They know how to look at the standard metagame and figure out how to um, attack it from the angle that Wizards is looking to do it mm -hmm. for FNM players. And so these Challenger decks were, there was, they were four of the top decks in the standard and they just put out Wizards pre-constructed versions of them that had kind of a limited number of rares and mythics, not all four of necessarily, but they were a lot better than the event decks they had come out with previously for standard. So yeah, so I, one way to kind of look at it, and it's going to be the one that most people are most focused on, is what were the prices of the cards in the deck before they came out with, and how much the SRP on that deck is. So a challenger deck is, retails at $29.99 versus that, uh, event decks, which are $24.99, so it's a $5 uh, price increase. But where event decks were often not even worth necessarily the cost of the pack. Right, I remember when they were coming out, like we would be able to sell them the way we were supposed to, where it's like, oh, you know, you're looking to level up a little bit. Why don't you buy this and jump into F and M? Mm -hmm. But anybody who had looked at the deck list would know that like it was not really better than the deck they had already put together using an intro pack plus a handful of boosters. Mm -hmm. You know, it usually had like a couple of good cards, but it was like nowhere close to anything that was good in standard. Like uh, it was just kind of just an upgraded intro deck, but not. Not so much so, not where it needed to be. Right. Like, people who would buy the event decks were like people who were looking for Hallowed Fountains, mm -hmm. and there was a Hallowed Fountain in there, plus enough, you know, like Vernon Cat that Vernon Catacomb to be was, worth it. Vernon Catacomb was in oh, yeah, the back event in the deck day. back in the day. Stoneforge Mystic was in an event deck back in the day. Actually, that's the most famous event deck probably out there, one of two, the other one being the modern one, just because they came out with an event deck that was released either around or after the ban announcement for Stoneforge Mystic being banned out of modern. Yeah, I think it was after because they they do the ban announcements right before a set comes out yeah. and they did the ban announcement and then when the set came out was when the event deck was going to come out. Right. It was like when, I don't know. It was, it was uh, the core set. 
because it, it was, was the it had, thing, the, yeah. had the fury sword or the sword that makes someone a, a chroma. Sword of Vengeance. Sword yeah. of Vengeance. Um, and in the 12 deck. or something. So Stoneforge Mystic was on that deck, so they made one conceit that Stoneforge Mystic was banned at all tournament level play unless you were playing exactly the list of cards that were in the event The entire deck. 75. You yeah. couldn't modify it, which, as we said, those decks were not very good. But if somebody wanted a Stoneforge Mystic, it was like a $10 card at the time, they might buy it because Stoneforge Mystic plus the rest of the cards right. added up to a little bit more than what you would well, pay. When I started playing, I bought a lot of, for instance, the dual decks because that's how I built my like backlog of collection, especially for Commander or other formats. Yeah, I mean, the trick about the cards. dual decks is like because they all have new border, everything's reprinted with a new border, you get a lot of people who are confused about formats that's like legal. modern. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I ended up with... Uh, you know, running a shop, I ended up with a lot of people who were just getting into modern who would have bought, you know, the the Merfolk versus Elves mm -hmm. dual deck or whatever, and they're playing like some elf card that's not legal in modern, right. but it has a modern border. Right. They just bought it two weeks ago. How is this not modern? And so dual decks are cool for what they're for, but they can be risky for building up I your think, collection. <laughs> I think dual decks were problematic as soon as modern was invented. Yeah. Like I got bit. really into dual decks before modern happened. So like I had like Gilliard versus Liana was one of the first ones I ever bought. And yeah. like, it like definitely helped me build up some of those early collections. But totally. as soon as modern happened and their like main reasoning for the beginning of the modern format was the card border they became more problematic than yeah they're the dual decks are very good for casual players though but even um, commander decks have that same problem but at least then it's like meant for an eternal format. yes it's this is a commander deck you are buying this for the purpose right. of playing commander right uh, um so so you know one of the things that we were talking about was price and the challenger decks though raise the price and instead of having cards that were generally worth a little bit less than that they were cost was ninety dollars before that on average? So right. Yeah. the The average of the four decks price at the time of release was ninety dollars if you added up all the singles, including commons and uncommons. So you're getting into a little bit of dollars and cents here. But they also right. had the red deck had a Chandra and a Hazaret and a uh, Glorybringer, which are all like staple cards. They were worth like twenty dollars. Well, right. not Glorybringer, but the Chandra and Hazaret were worth like twenty plus dollars at the time 40, of release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At the time and of release, then, but they've been up between twenty and forty during their life cycle. Yeah, and then the the vehicles deck just came with four heart of kieran mm -hmm. which was like a 20 dollar card just four of a mythic right <laughs> uh and so these decks really like kind of pushed the envelope of what of what they were willing to do in a pre-constructed deck and the players loved it i mean mm -hmm. the the shop uh heidi ho i've i've talked I, you know i go there regularly still and play and i talk to the people who are running it now like hey how's it going like i kind of miss working there a little right. bit but obviously it's great to design games at kess as well but <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, so they, they sold a ton of them, and people are just like, there are people who are still buying them for value. They're mm -hmm. like, I need a Chandra and a Hazaret because I'm building Mono Red, and I just am going to buy this because it's the easiest way to get those right. cards and cheaper. Um, but there are also a lot of people who are looking to level up from about intro pack level into competitive play. Right. And they, and oh, this and is I such a great starting magic point. to be able to just buy a deck instead of being like, oh, I like, had to find all of the pieces to Eldrazi Monument Elves, or like, I have this yeah. goblin list that doesn't do anything, is like, yeah would have made that jump up just a little bit more. Honestly, I played your Eldrazi Monument Elves deck in a standard tournament. You let me borrow it back in the day. I got totally crushed by Jund. They just like cascaded into a Maelstrom right. Pulse and killed two of my Arbor Elves or something. And I'm like, are we even playing the same game? Yeah, no, that deck was good against the blue white control decks because it's like Wrath of God. Is yeah, I played Jund Eldrazi every round, I yeah. think. <laughs> Jund was your problem. Um, so yeah, so, so you know, it, the other thing to talk towards is that like, then they came out with the modern event deck. And this mm -hmm. was a $75 retail versus the normal 25, so it was three times as expensive. Um, and that deck inside of it had a value of around, you know, this is from a professor video where he did, is it worth it to buy the event deck back in the day? Um, from Solarian Community College, he did, it was around 140 to $200. Like bottom That's low not bad. was 140 and 200 was there. So there was definitely I mean, a jump better, up. It's better than what they had been doing with their pre-constructed decks previously. Like the standard Correct. event decks were, were, not, were not really there. Mm -hmm. I mean, like working at the shop, we kind of felt bad when we would be like, yeah, you can just buy this and jump right into FNM. It's totally cool because that's how you're supposed to market it. But the whole time we were kind of like, Ugh. right, <laughs> you can't really do that. You're going to lose really bad. But, you know, part of these pre-constructed decks is that they, they want it to be an entry point where you can open it up and play an FNM and not have an awful time but also the purpose is to get you to upgrade it like they don't want to give you a completed budget deck right, right? they don't want to give you like for example like you know they could give you for standard say the paradoxical outcome deck probably all the cards in that deck for standard 
are within the you know the ninety dollar budget that they mm -hmm. kind of have. Maybe you're not playing Karn in the sideboard or something. But other than that, you're like you're basically there. Right. But that's like once you buy that deck, you're done. There's there's nowhere for you to go. Right. And so they're trying to give you not just a jumping off point for standard, but a, a way for you to kind of build on it in your own way. Mm -hmm. So you buy this red deck and you're like, wow, Chandra and Hazaret are great. I need to buy more of these cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they, they built the deck in a way where like playing one of each actually made a little bit of sense because you're, they were like a little bit faster than the red decks that are in standard, Ooh, which are right. playing more four and five drop Glorybringer Hazarets, and they were playing more one and two drops in the deck to kind of like, you know, not just build a bad version of what exists, but build kind of a different type of red deck that kind of got you on the path if you wanted to expand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it really is like kind of an interesting thing when you look at how to build one of these decks. You don't want to make them optimal. You just want to make them good enough that people can play with them, but then direct people on the path to optimize them. Right. But they're different than, say, what pre-con decks are, which is more just like, here's an introduction on how to play Magic to play casually. Right. It is something that like, especially in modern, where decks are so much more about game plans and, and kind of accomplishing those game plans, especially decks that are affordable. Like, yeah. if you want to buy a deck that's just kind of like doing stuff and is going to react to what their opponent does and does a little bit of everything, those are the Juns and the Jess guys that are 1000 to $3,000 decks, yeah. where compared to like Hollowed One or Scape Shift, which we'll talk about yeah. in a second, where these are decks that are actually more affordable, but those decks have a very linear path. So like you can't really play Scape Shift without multiple Valakuts, uh, Primeval Titans, and Scape Shifts. Like, yeah, I mean like, like mo Modern is a lot more linear. Like the, the linchpins of the standard red deck are say Hazaret and Chandra and Glorybringer, mm -hmm. but you can build a good red deck, and they did, with one of each of those cards. Right. And in modern, that's like can be a little bit more difficult because the decks tend to be more linear. Right, and I think that's kind of what they did with vehicles, is they realized there's a little bit more of a linearity. Like, we can yeah. put in bad vehicles here, totally. but you know what? Let's just tank this one card. We'll give four mythics to every person, but yeah. like this deck now works versus without it, where it just wouldn't. Yeah, right. and you, like reprinting a card into standard is not... Like that's not really going to affect people's collection a lot in the way that like reprinting a modern card like Scape Shift into standard is going to affect the price because standard prices are fluctuating all the time. There's like always an impending rotation. I mean, standard is just so much more volatile mm -hmm. that like printing three Heart of Kirins into the format is not really going to break anybody's you know. Right. So so now let's talk about the modern challenger decks that were. So today the rest of this episode is going to be spent kind of not the rest of the episode but for the next uh, segment we're going to be talking about how we would build modern event decks. Like what tools would we make pieces? What kind of philosophy do you think we want to belong to it? What price points we're aiming at and then which archetypes we picked? And then some spicy picks we have for those archetypes. Yeah, I mean, because if you look at the at the standard event deck list, they always tried to put in something that was like a little spicier. I have them, I, I brought them up and I I took notes and I left them upstairs before we came down into the episode. But I, I So was, for, uh, for the modern event deck, which is a good one to point at, they have stuff like uh, Zealous Prosecution. In their black because it was a black white token list. I think that's pretty standard in black white tokens, but I Shrine think something like Elspeth Knight Errant as a one of, yep. or or like two Shrine of Loyal Legions. Like these are cards that didn't quite make the cut in the deck, mm -hmm. but they're they're cheap ish. I mean, Elspeth is a planeswalker; she's not super cheap, but sure. she's a, a card people like playing with. And these are ways that they can kind of like lead you on the path of kind of like making your own interesting decisions about deck building. Mm -hmm. Interesting so like, enough, the paper version of this deck is still one hundred and seventy four dollars. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's like held its value for the seventy. Yeah, and there's like point. no shocks or fetches or nope. anything like that. It's just straight up. The the big black, white the big tokens. things that you just held on to that ended up being worth something were Inquisition of Kozlek and Path to Exile. Yeah, like Path is just they could reprint it forever, but it's still the most important removal spell in the format. And then there's like Sword of Feast and Famines in the deck, and that's still thirty four bucks because. Sword of Feast and Famine is just one of the probably all-time favorite cards of a lot of people. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, that's a commander one for sure. Although yeah. it, when it shows up in Modern, I'm all, it always gets my attention, which is the reason oh, yeah. they put it in the deck, because you're like, oh, I get to play with this? It basically says take an extra turn on it. And the fact that like we're now in a world where Abrupt Decay isn't the top four most played removal spells in the format makes it a lot more viable than yeah, it used to be. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
yes, like call against command. Call against command exists, but, but commons you're at least getting not one for one because they get whatever the second effect they yeah. pick. But at least your mana well, cost is and, the same as and, what it is. Well, you had to pay to equip, so not really. But but the, uh, yeah, the way that Sword of Feast and Famine usually plays out is you like wait until your opponent is tapped out, and you're probably like a blue tempo deck, like mm -hmm. a Delver or like a like a Fairies or something, right. and you are able to like tap out to play the sword and equip, hit them while they're not expecting it, and then you untap all your lands. And so you now have you have magic counter magic, you have restoration angel, you right. have like a million things up, and they discarded a card, and they're like, oh, I guess Coligan's command, and you're like, ha ha, Romand, gotcha. I wouldn't be surprised also, and I'd have to, I guess I can click on it and actually look. I wouldn't be surprised if this recently bounced up a little bit. It did bounce up a little bit and then went down again um, because of the Stoneforge Mystic speculation. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. Because don't I don't think that would be the premier sword, but it would be one people out there. It's on. the second place one. I mean, it's Batter Skull for sure, but then... I have, I'd put War and Peace above it, I think. They're or close Fire Ice. for what you just described. Like, Stoneforge Mystic's game plan of, like, play it early, and then you can just keep mana up forever is better with Sword of Feast of Famine that's than true. It, that's than true. it is with Fire and Ice. It's better in, like, a, like a Blade, Esper Stoneblade yeah. type deck, yeah. Um, but so like the spicy stuff they put in the standard decks, they put like a, they did a blue white approach to the second sun deck, which is like was the premier control deck in standard mm -hmm. at the time, and still kind of sees play. Although some of the people are just cutting the approaches and using Teferi putting himself back into your own deck so you don't deck out before your opponent as their wing con, oh, which is pretty unpleasant. But <laughs> but at the time Teferi hadn't been printed when they made these sure. decks. So so Kefnet the mindful. There's one in the main, one in the board. Um, there's one. Uh, farm to market and four aether meltdown which are like both removal spells that kind of show up in standard because you have to get a little creative with blue white removal spells you can't just play four path <laughs> right it's the same way that people play like condemn in modern if they're looking for a fifth white mm -hmm. removal spell in a control deck because like your options are kind of limited so it's playing like a few of these like kind of spicier cards to get you thinking about the deck and not just straightforward, here's, right. a, here's the approach of the second sun deck that top aided the pro tour, minus all the expensive cards, right? right? Like, <laughs> Well, that's like, when we were building this list the entire time, I was like, oh man, if Chalice wasn't like a $80 card that to play four of them would just max out our budget, it would be really good for this because Chalice decks play really off the wall removal spells. They play stuff like yeah. Journey to Nowhere because they can't play Bolt or Path or, or Fatal Push yeah. because Chalice turns it off. Yeah, it kind of forces you to get creative. But Chalice itself is so expensive that, that those decks are the one that all works. So back to my notes so I can read what we're supposed to be talking about next because that's the power of what we're doing. Um, so yeah, so okay, so so the first thing we did, and, and kind of it was is a combination of a we just thought we kind of needed to raise the price point, similar to how they raised the price point from twenty five to thirty dollars for the challenger decks. And yeah, I mean modern is just much more expensive. We wanted to make sure we kind of did something comparable, and the other thing is when you look at it, before it was three times. So so a challenger deck was twenty five. It was thirty. Challenger decks are thirty. Challenger deck are thirty dollars, um, and. But, uh, sorry, the point, sorry, uh, event decks were 25 and the modern event decks was $75. So that's three times. That's a th three times as expensive as, as a challenger oh, deck. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I misunderstood. I thought we were talking about card value. Yeah, we have the next step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you're I'm ready, ready, for, the, I'm ready okay. for the next step. So back step. to what we're talking about. Event decks, $25, challenger decks, 30. Event, event deck, 25. Modern event deck, 75, three times that. So a yeah. challenger deck, $30 times three is 90. And we rounded yeah. that up to 100 mostly because we just felt like it and made our lives a lot easier. <laughs> um, and so then if you look at what the value is in a challenger deck, it's around $90. So it's three times expensive on top of that of right. what a challenger deck is. And Wizards always says that they don't, you know, they acknowledge the collectability of the cards, but they don't actually acknowledge the distinct secondary market. I don't know exactly how true that is because if you look at the, at the re on release, the values of the challenger decks, they're all very close close to $90. So it seems like if they weren't just like going on TCG player with a budget, they were doing something similar because right. it's it's pretty close for all of them. And so when we were looking at it, we were okay, multiply it by three because that's what they did. So that gives us in the same grand that gives us $300. And with $300, you can get pretty close with a few different archetypes and something that we're going to throw to you guys, people listening now in the future or watching, uh, to go to the Facebook group. So now we're back to shout outs. Before Facebook to group, YouTube comments, tweet us. Everywhere you can find us, uh, <laughs> which, you know, pretty much at the MMCast or website name slash the MMCast, you'll get to us. Um, 
Tell us what list you think. Come up with a, a, you know, you have a modern deck list, it needs to be competitive, and you have $300 to spend. Right, and we're not looking for something that's like a budget deck, right? Because because this is something that we want, you would want somebody to buy and go to FNM and be like, after playing this deck, I really thought of a great way to upgrade it. Because like, I can be, I can do, I can look at uh, MTG Goldfish right now and look through, they have like an entire section of modern decks that are like uh, under 150 or $100, and those, are fine, but we're looking at something like, can you build a competitive modern deck for under $300? Right. And, and that includes substituting things. Like the mana base is one of the easiest places to start looking at ways to make things less expensive. Right. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we think this is a space where you don't need four of us. Like for instance, we're gonna talk about uh, hollow one decks and we're, we cut down to less blood gas because all four makes it so that when you buy the deck, you don't have to find more of them. And well, and and obviously it, it impacts our budget. Right. So it's kind of a win-win to cut a blood gas since that's not a totally essential card. Would we ever cut like, you know, um, a we wouldn't cut like a like a hollow one from the mm-hmm. hollow one deck or like right. a Gurmag angler, but but something like blood gas where it's like a little more expensive and it's not necessarily a key feature of a the key deck. feature of the deck. Yeah, right. like the, the, if you have something that's like really expensive, play four of them. But if you yeah. have something that you're like, this is a little bit more of an expensive card, it gives people an onus to collect. It sh- and it's in the deck, so you can see what it does. Right. You're like, wow, Bloodgast is actually really great here, and I need to pick up another one. Right. <laughs> and and some of what we did here is also, you know, we now know that we're returning to Ravnica. Returning, returning to Ravnica, Ravnica um, in the fall and all of next year, and there is a safe assumption that some amount of Shocklands will be reprinted. That might be not true, is, but is I'm making some a amount guess. ten? Do yeah. you think they're going to print ten? Exactly ten of them. That's a good number, but not like multiples of the ten. There will be only ten in all packs in the world, so you can get one Hollowed Fountain. It seems bad. It seems bad. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so yeah, we think super Shocks expeditions. Are being printed. Super right expeditions. here first. Um, but so those are being printed. Maybe we don't have no confirmation, but we're predicting that here. Um, and so we were a little bit looser with those in our budget. I mean, we were just to be totally honest, we're printing them into the ground here. I mean, not totally, but there are some decks here, specifically the regular shapeshift one. We'll talk about that we're playing for because you need to play four, and there's no way around it, and we're fine with that. I mean, at the time of Return to Ravnica, the shocks were printed into the ground. I mean, yeah. most of them were like seven bucks, yeah. which is fine, which is where they should be. So let's get into the deck list. You ready? Which one yeah. do you start with? Uh, let's do Scapeshift last. That'll okay. segue into our Scapeshift cool. conversation if we want. So let's start with uh, the one that is. We're the talking most... about Hollow One, right? Yeah. Let's, let's just keep one. talking okay. about Hollow One. All right. Blackbird Hollow One. It's actually not that expensive. I like looked at it. The most expensive yeah. part of it are like the lands and then like Goblin game, not Goblin lore. game, Goblin, Goblin lore, lore yeah. which like is a card that A, should not be as expensive as it is, but B, we also made the conceit and only printed two and printed two Cathodic Reunions in our list. Bring so at, we'll, uh, I we'll mean, post the list on. I'm going to post the list right now on Facebook. And, and Goblin Lore is definitely a card that's like on Wizards Radar to reprint in like a Modern Masters set. I mean, if we're lucky, it'll be in a Commander deck, although maybe that would be bad because then you run into the problem where everybody buys one one of the Commander decks because it has Goblin Lore in it. Yeah. But they'll reprint Goblin Lore somewhere, like a Battle Bond type thing or something goofy like that. But, right. but that's. We just didn't. We don't think that if they did challenger decks for modern right now that there would just be like four goblin lore so <laughs> that would be one of the places where you have room to upgrade yeah and, and i think that's fair it's like a very obvious card you want more of and there were a surprising a lot of things that you could play kind of instead of that and one of them was cathartic reunion is this link on the stream yeah i just posted the link to wow the list. that's really cool okay cool yeah, you can, if you're on the Facebook stream right now, you can see the list. We will be recommending I people. was wondering how we were going to post these lists. I didn't realize you could just do that. That's yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, the power of... Oh, it's not on the screen of here. Oh, got it. Okay. It's, on the, it's, on the, it's in the comments. Still cool. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of staples in this deck that are really cheap. Flame, Flame Wake Phoenix is really easy to include as a four of. Yeah. Uh, Flame Blade Adept. Street Wraith, Gurmag Angler, uh, in our list we And I would say that one. those are all like very essential pieces of yeah. the deck. You, uh, we you, you would never play there. Hollow One without four Street Wraiths. Right, right. Or four Flame Blade Adepts, because you need that one drop. Correct. We did include one blown Bloodstained Mire, partly just to kind of inform people that you should be picking up more of them. Yeah. The deck needs them. Um, yeah, because of Delve, like it's pretty crucial to be putting 
sh- stuff more in your of a graveyard as easily. Yeah. Thing. yeah, and we, you know, it, we kind of hinted that this was something you should maybe do without fully jumping into it. Um, included one collective brutality. That's another expensive card. The deck normally plays two. I think you can get by with one and then play with other alternatives. Yeah. Uh, our spiciest includes, and it kind of is what's replacing collective brutality, are lightning axe and conflagrate. Yeah, I mean, they're also a cheap removal spell like Collective Brutality. Um, they allow you to, to discard like Collective mm-hmm. Brutality because that's a deck where like you very consistently on turn one, two, three need to be discarding a lot of cards. Right. Um, Conflagrate is more of a late game option, but it it's cool. I mean, it, it's good yeah. in a lot of matchups where you're going to need to deal with multiple creatures. Right. Like uh, elves or other Collected Company decks. I mean, Dredge was playing Conflagrate for a long time. Yeah, it's, I think it still is. Probably, yeah. and and my my like the fact that you can just burn your opponent out if you're like oh man I need to do three more damage, just blow them yeah up. yep. Um, so that's Black Red Hollow, and the next deck we're going to talk about is Blue White Spirits. So this is a deck that's more powerful now because of M nineteen, um, and kind of one of the big value cards we decided to reprint here because it is the one deck that needs value more than other ones. Like for the most part, this deck is actually relatively inexpensive to build um, was we did add some a cavern missiles. Well, and so, you know, when, when we were building this, we were talking about the way that people typically build spirits decks. And because you are playing like a bunch of three drops, like a lot of the notable spirits in modern guys, St. Traff, Spell Queller, um, you know, Drog Skull Captain are all three mana cards. A lot of times these decks are playing Noble Hierarch or Aether Vial, right. which are both kind of out of our price range uh, for these decks because if you're playing if you're playing Aether Vials or Noble Hierarchs, it seems kind of silly to not play four in a deck like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so and there's a way to take this kind of towards a Bant color thing, and we, we did discuss that. We were resistant to really build a mana base that focused on that in this format because of the fact that we don't have fetch lands. Um, Mike flipped over. Uh, because we don't have fetch lands really available to us, because we don't have the ability to build like full-on three-color mana bases that felt safe, especially in a format where you will be playing against Blood Moon, creating a deck list that felt a little bit more along the lines of yeah, and, and a, blue, a two-color, like, it felt safer. And what's nice about there being two different builds of spirits, there being like an Aether Vial build and like a green build with Noble Hierarch and Collected Company, it means that like you have you have a choice when you play this deck. Mm-hmm. You know, you buy this deck, you play it at FNM, you're like, I could really use some acceleration, let me look at what's out there. Mm-hmm. And and Noble Hierarch and Aether Vial are two different paths that you can kind of experiment with, which mm-hmm. is which is the point of these decks, is it's supposed to be something that you can build on and you can kind of, you know, make into something greater than what, right. it, what comes in the box. And some of the key cards, like we have four Mausoleum Wanderers, we have four Rattle Chains, we have four Jog School Captains, we have four Supreme Phantoms, which are the which is the new Lord. But then, you know, we get a little bit spicier. There's only three Selfless Spirits, but that's obviously a key card of the deck that you can realize you need to pick up more of. Three Spell Quellers, which is another card that's definitely something they're like, oh, I need, oh, this card was really good. Can, how do I get my fourth one? So you have a little bit of that kind of play. And totally. then we have like, the fun ones like Remorseful Cleric, which we obviously yeah. in the sideboard are maxing out on, but like in the and main Selfless deck, it's Spirit spicy. is also a card that I think is like, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on blue white spirits, so don't don't rip me up in the comments, but but I I feel like Selfless Spirit is like kind of a meta call. I mean, it's good right now because mm-hmm. everybody's playing Wrath of God and Anger of the Gods and everything because you have to beat humans. Right. But like you know, by giving somebody only three Selfless Spirits, it, it lets them know that like this is a card that is good in the deck, mm-hmm. but you are not necessarily needing to max right. out on it, but it's meta dependent. And you're in, and, and like, you're always gonna want to modify your deck based on the metagame, especially in modern. And the key cards of this deck like really are Mausoleum Warner, Wanderer, Rattle Chains, and Spell Queller and Drag Skull Captain, and everything else in it is just kind of the supplement that plan. Right. Um, well uh, and you said Supreme Phantom, right? Yeah, it's a free pick. Okay, yes, that because that's a new key card for the spirit deck. Correct. I mean, I think that's the reason that in right now today, if you were building a spirit deck, you're probably doing it because they just printed Supreme Phantom, right. and that's a great card. You're not you're not into Remorseful Cleric. You don't want to exile some graveyards. Uh, that is a great card for modern, also. Yeah, but it doesn't <laughs> make me same. want to build a spirit deck as much as maybe like a like a Court of Calling deck right. or something. <laughs> and then the sideboard, you know, we put some dispels in there, a Geist of Saint Traft. Because why not? It's a spirit and it's the best. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's an okay sideboard yeah. card if you're it, like a lot of matchups. It just wins, but it can be kind of clunky to be playing a two-two Correct. for three if they're playing hollow ones Especially against when you all or the something. You're doing are bigger than that. You have Kataki, which is a spirit. You have uh, more remorseful clerics. Adelana of Rhetoric is also a spirit for your storm matchup. So there's a lot of little pieces in there that you can get to be able to kind of build a deck off of that. And you mentioned the Cavern of Souls, right? Oh yes, we yeah, were saying that's the big value card. Yes, yep. Cavern of Souls. Yep. Uh huh. 
And that's Next that's step. also to kind of replace Aether Vial as like a way for your creatures to not get countered. Right. Because um, you know, because you're playing more expensive creatures, you're more likely to be running into counter magic. And, and I have Fairy Conclave instead of like some like as a man land that's thrown in there instead of a instead of like a mutant or, vault or something vault yeah. that kind of plays in that space as well because you just want. But some I think type that's a that's attack. a good card in, in a deck like this. Right, Moreland Haunt is a spicy include. Do do blue white spirit decks not play that? I don't that? think they play it. That's a great card. Yeah, they make spirits. Yeah, they get pumped by all your stuff. Yeah. Uh, all right, next card. I think most of them don't play because it's either three colors. <laughs> Decks where you like you don't really That's have the true. room in the That's true. Base. You can't play a colorless um, land. Yeah. The Aether Vile decks are probably playing it though, right? Yeah, I can maybe, maybe see it. Those are newer anyways because they just got all the new pieces. That's true. Yeah. Well, you probably were not only going to play two colors before Supreme Phantom, but Supreme Phantom allows the deck to be a little bit faster. Correct. So second to last, we got Black Weight Eldrazi. So this is actually the closest to a list we literally just found online. Like, we made pretty minimal modifications. Yeah, it's kind of a cheap deck. Mostly it was in the mana base, and we just kind of brought the mana base down. And the other one and is the deck vials. ran four Aether Vials, and we brought it down to two Aether Vials just because we can't afford it under our $300 budget here, and, and I think, included two Mind Stones. I think that Aether Vial is, like, more of a hallmark of this deck versus Blue-White Spirits because... It's playing the Lean and Arbiter getcha plan. Right. You, you're, you like, you're sacrificing your lands to, to be Ghost Quarters or your you need to be like deploying disruptive threats, threats quickly. You're playing mm -hmm. more like a death and taxes style. Correct. Then whereas spirits, which is kind of just like, I need a little bit of acceleration and I don't want to play green. Right. <laughs> and the power level of a card like Flicker Wisp specifically is yeah. significantly higher at instant speed versus sorcery speed to the point where it's almost not a card if you're playing at a sorcery yeah, speed. Yeah, and, and like if you are playing at instant speed, it does something. You know, if you if you're playing a deck like Black White Eldrazi, it's because you want to put Tide Hollow Sculler in on their draw step right. with an Aether Vial. That's the reason you're playing the deck, right. because you think that's dope. <laughs> and that's what this deck does. You know, it's playing Restoration Angel, and it's playing Eldrazi Displacer be to be able to do that kind of off of the the, the Aether Vial. So it gives yeah. you other options to be able to do that with. All of your other things, Wasteland Stranger, Thought Not Seer, Blade Splicer, Tide Hollow Scholar are all ETB effects. And then you're yeah. just playing a Thalia Lean and Arbiter package on the front end to kind of keep you up ahead on mana and to be able to lock your opponent out with all the paths you're playing because you want to be exiled. Right, and you're you're able to take cards out of their hand. So once you've seen their hand with Tide Hollow Scholar on turn two, you take something, you're playing a Thalia on turn three, you're playing Thought Not Seer on turn four. Now at this point, whatever they're left with, they probably can't even cast. Right. <laughs> Maybe you've destroyed one of their lands at some point. Yep. I mean, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm posting the list so people can see it. Yep, uh, that's important. Pretty calm. Everybody follow along. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think I think this deck like came out pretty pretty solid and it's just kind of a deck that. What's exists. the what's the spiciness in here? Uh, the spiciness isn't here. I would go with a. We're playing a warping whale. All right. Which is pretty. Pretty spicy. There's some in the sideboard. And it, it's a good card. It does a lot. I uh, mean, yeah, countering a sorcery is is something that like people are not generally going to be playing around and you you'll get them mm -hmm. uh the other card is mindstone so mindstone because we had to cut down the aether vials we needed something else to kind of compete in that space and mindstone allows you to ramp to your four drops while also um ramp to your four drops while also sacking it for value when you no longer need it in the late game yeah i mean getting getting turn three thought not is i suppose the other good reason to play black white eldrazi right. although you can do that in eldrazi tron as well but um, yeah, turn three Thought Knot is just like such a beating against mid-range decks people, because yeah. oh, they're going to have problems with the 4-4 four, four, and they're going to have a lot more problems with the 4-4 four, four if you take their terminate. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, the, 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 one of the weirder value things is we're playing one Evolving Wilds just because we're playing with Waste, Swamps, and Plains and being able to get that Waste if you need it, but really fix your mana. It's definitely worse and you would not do this if you were building this deck past this, but just yeah. like as a, a conceit to price and fetch needs. Um, and so yeah, so that's, that's the last of those before we get into the big one that I think is my favorite one, which is, and also the second half of our episode, Red Green Scape Shift. Scape Shift. Red Green Scape Shift. Um, this deck is also, with the reprinting of the cards that were reprinted, become much more affordable. Cards that were reprinted being Scape Shift? Yeah. Uh, Valkyrie is now the most expensive card in the set, and it's still like in under 20. Deck. In the deck, sorry. Yeah. In the deck, and it's under 20. Primeval Titan has basically been printed into the ground. Blood Braided Elf has come back up, but it's still not worth 
You yeah, I mean, people aren't also, playing it a ton in Modern, and it's an Uncommon that's been printed a ton. Right. They're like, all cards get a hand up. This is the one deck where we did max out on Stopping Grounds. So we maxed out on four Stopping Grounds, Ford Shelter Ticket, and Ford Cinder Glade to get yeah. maximum Mountain Forest. Because the the, scape, the Titan Shift deck, which is the version of Scape Shift that we built here, is effectively a green deck, uh, except that you have to be playing a ton of Mountains. Correct. So if your Mountains tap for green, that's exactly what you need. <laughs> right. And, and with that alongside that, there is a level of... Just good red cards you play like Lightning Bolt and Sweltering Suns, which is actually keep you alive keep, until yeah, you, you can alive. get seven mana. Correct. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, talking about the, some of the spicy cards, Corsair Crucifix and Reclamation Sage are my big two spicy. Not Reclamation Sage. Yeah, Reclamation Sage I think is pretty standard because uh, Tracker. You can't lose to turn three Blood Moon out of Mardu Pyromancer or whatever. You gotta have. You gotta be able to summoners packed for that Reclamation. Sage. Most cards that wreck you game one or in game two or three reclamation sage uh is very helpful to have in your deck and yeah you, you can tutor, tutor for tutor it targets for it so we have it. the two summoners packed because it's a pretty Correct. essential essential part of the deck and they're not too pricey yeah um they're not pri they're like four dollars but there's like, also so also wait what, what's the what's the spice it's Corsair of crew fix and, and tireless tracker uh we got a tireless tracker like a, in the main got a landfall package because you're yeah. ramping so much that every single ramp spell you have, you know, you're playing Farseek, you're playing Search for Tomorrow, and you're playing, obviously, Scape Shift. And all of those cards, and Sacred Tribe Elder, and all of them just get you extra triggers on those two cards that can be threats on their own. Yeah, I was discussing, actually, Titan Shift sideboard uh, with a buddy uh, recently because he was thinking about putting the deck together, and he knew I played Scape Shift, so he was asking me about it. Um, and I was saying that, like, with the red-green version, it, like, sideboarding can be kind of tough because, like, you have to dedicate a lot of slots to any card you actually want to draw because you don't have any card draw in the deck. You're just ramping and playing Primeval Titans. And you have the Summoner's Pack to tutor for creatures, but a lot of times you need like an answer to a Blood Moon or something. Or And people are playing Torpor Orb from humans now, so maybe you need your Reclamation Sage won't even do it anymore right. or something. Right. And so um, you want... Like, Tireless Tracker in the main gives you a way to like beat a Blood Moon because you can... Make Tireless Tracker big, mm -hmm. and like when you play Primeval Titan, instead of hitting them, you're like drawing cards. You're drawing up to your nature's claim where right. you can like kill them. It, it gives you a lot of different versatility in the deck that Blood Raid also, also offered. One of the new things totally. that they started doing was just playing Blood Raid because Blood Raid is just good. Yeah, it's just, your it's card advantage. Doing. Right. Um, it'll so, it'll attack if you are the aggressor in the mm -hmm. matchup, and it'll block if you're not, and it's all it's it'll ramp you or it'll get a lightning bolt right. or right, right. right. Um, okay, so that is that is it for the decks. Those are our four. Black White Eldrazi, Blue White Spirits, Red Green um, Scape Shift. Titan and Shift. Red Titan green, Shift specifically. Yeah, Red Green Titan Shift specifically, uh, and Black Red Hollow. So wait, we were, uh, one thing I think that is worth noting is uh, we're on three Primeval Titan and three Scape Shift in the deck. Yes, and two um, Valka, which used to be Valka. what people played. Now, new Scape Shift decks have been on to four, but as we mentioned, <laughs> Yeah, which, which is somewhat a concession to budget, but it's the reason that we included, um, you know, there's one Thrag Tusk and the one Tireless Tracker and the one Courser, is it gives you, well, the Courser gives you a little bit of deck velocity. You can right. play the top card off of your library, drawing closer to the Primeval Titans that you need to win. Uh, and then the Tireless Tracker and the Thrag Tusk are just kind of like, we, we can't afford to play four Scape Shift for Primeval Titan because we're trying to keep this at a reasonable level budget-wise, you know, because if we're wizards, we don't want to flood the market with these mythics or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have some alternate threats in the deck. Uh, right. Courts are not being a threat, but being more uh, a card velocity engine so that you can it, get It protects your, you, gets you to the late game because it A games you life and, and blocks. And it, yes, and it allows you to play the lands off the top of your deck, right. drawing closer to your, your big threats. Right, right. So we're kind of building velocity engines into the deck. And right, also so, so when we're building these decks, we think it's important to make sure that... We're while covering the weaknesses we're creating. Right, we're creating weaknesses by not being able to afford to play Primeval Titans and Scape Shifts, but we're trying to shore those up by including diversity of threats. Correct. Um, the next section is we're going to talk about Scape Shift. Now we're just going to that. But before we do that, I do want to do a few shout outs. First one, uh, make sure to check out Battle Bosses. It's the game we both designed. You can go look it up at battlebosses.com. It's a, a collectible uh, figure game. You get a bunch of miniatures and it plays, you start upgrading them with cards. It plays a little bit like if Risk 
and Magic met with each other and had a, a, a child and then made that child play League of Legends. <laughs> so check that out. It's really fun. Uh, the Kickstarter launch is August 14th. We're going to be pre previewing it at Comic-Con uh, at GPLA. So that's the, the first week of the Kickstarter. And then at uh, Gen Con, uh, which is the first week of August. And you can check us out there if you're going to any of those events. If you're not going to those events, the Kickstarter is August 14th and uh, stuff will be available as time goes on. Go to battlebosses.com to put your email in to subscribe for more information or like any of the pages that are on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Yeah, we're, uh, we're everywhere. We're facebook.com slash battlebossesgame. Yep. Um, so check that out. Uh, make sure to also check out the Command Zone. They're our sister podcast. Uh, they do awesome Commander content. If you like Commander, they are the best place to go for any of that kind of stuff. I was on an episode a few weeks ago where we actually previewed a Battle Boss character, and they um, do Game Nights as well, which is one of the best shows about magic out there. Uh, yeah. I, I was on the second episode, and I still get people who like I used to go to high school with or college with who like are just getting back into magic, and they do it because they watch Game Nights, and then they're like, oh wait, I saw you, and it freaks them out because they're like, I know that guy. Uh, so that's cool, so check that out. Um, and then last but not least, uh, make sure to check out our Patreon. So we have a Patreon that is the way we're able to do this. It's the reason we were able to start accomplishing doing video every week. Uh, it's going to help us kind of get to the next steps and create more and more content. We can't do this without you guys. We definitely appreciate it. And if you check that out, we're patreon.com slash the MMcast. And now, let's talk about Skate Shift. This is a deck of choice. This is an interesting deck just in the history of modern. Uh, you know, Valakut, which was the first deck that ever existed, which is when Primeval Titan and Valakut were in the format together, is possibly to be blamed partly for the Cobblade era. I mean, a lot of the kind of puff pieces of that time pointed all out that Cobblade was dominant because it was so good against Valakut, and then Valakut was so good at destroying any deck that ever had a chance of being Cobblade that it just made it, like, Vengevine, a favorite card of mine, was printed to be an anti-Jace card, but because Valakut just wrecked any deck that tried playing Vengevines, there was just no chance for them to compete in the format, and so it kind of started out shutting stuff out, and then when they created Overextended and it rotated into that, or uh, over, yeah, just extended, not overextended, um, when they shortened Extended to the four-year period, it became a dominant force there because you had Scape Shift finally, and you had Scape Shift and you had Prismatic Omen, and together with those two cards, it became a dominant force there as and well. And a lot of times people played Jace, which is where people got the idea for the Teamer Scape Shift decks, is right. that people wanted to play Jace to help you find your pieces more quickly, and the mana bases in Extended at the time were just good enough to do that. You had Filter Lands and... And, and reflecting so, pools and such. And so Modern was created, and they banned Valkyrie out the gate. It was, it was yep, one of the... They didn't want Modern to be too similar to Extended. Right. They wanted people to be brewing new stuff at the beginning of the format. That's so why they Bitter banned, Blossom was banned. That's why Valkyrie was banned. That's why um, Jace was banned. Dark Depths Dark. and... Thes uh, Dark Depths and... Well, those um, weren't legal in, in oh, Extended. Or that wasn't a deck in Extended. There was a there was a in, thought in, in, in extended it was a deck but not in the four year extended fair but I yeah. think that one of the reasons those cards started out banned is because they had seen their power level in extended and they were like let's have people do new stuff in modern right. so right. sword of the meek which is now a card that got unbanned made no waves sword of the meek and dark depths were both banned at the start of the format because of their, their lifetime the extended yep. and they wanted you to be doing new things yeah. and I mean I've played sword of the meek combo in legacy and it's much more powerful there but because you have stuff like miracles going on that you can protect it. So, like, it made sense. So, Valkyrie starts in the format band. It's one of the first cards they ever unbanned. Um, it was pretty quickly unbanned, and it was fine. Scape Shift became a deck. It was one, it was probably, it's always been kind of where it is now, where it's a tier two deck. Um, people were playing it in the rug shells, which is where they first kind of thought of playing it. Um, and then the Delve spells were printed, and it became the best one of the best four decks in the format. Like oh yeah, I was already playing Scape Shift. So, so my history with Scape Shift was the first modern deck I ever built. Um, basically, I wanted to be playing. Um, I wanted to be playing Eternal Command. I, I had seen. Uh, you know, I was I was a, a fairly casual player at the time. Mm -hmm. I was playing like drafts was like the most competitive thing that I was doing, but I wasn't really playing competitive constructed. Sure. So when I thought of constructed, I thought of it as more casual because I was like playing commander and stuff. Right. So, so I um, I I saw Eternal Command on the World Championship stream. Uh, Shoti Yasuoko was playing it against like the best players in the world, and he's like looping Cryptic Command with Eternal Witness. He's like viling in Eternal Witness to get back Cryptic Command, counter your spell, bounce my Eternal Witness, do it again next turn. You know, like bolt snap, bolt, 
mm -hmm. play hunt master, kill you. Like right. um, the deck just seems super cool to me, but it used a lot of fetch lands because um, you were playing Tarmogoyf in the deck right. and you were playing Tarmogoyf. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, was Tarmogoyf expensive at this point? Uh, it was very that? expensive back yeah. then, yes. Yeah. It, much more actually than it is now. Yeah. Uh, it was probably like $150 a piece or something. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to build that deck. So while I was putting the mana base together, um, I, I was on a budget, and so while I was putting the mana base together, I didn't have money for all the fetches, and I was like, well, Scape Shift is a deck that uses the same colors, it uses Snapcasters and Cryptics, but I don't need to pick up a playset of Calling Turns and a playset of Misty Rainforest just yet. I, I can work on that while I play the deck, right? Build up some store credit right. by playing in tournaments. And so I built uh, Team or Scape Shift, and at the time, Valakut had recently been unbanned, but there had been enough tournament results that people had realized it's not insane. And so the price of scape shifts was low. I've actually bought my scape shifts for $7 a sure. piece. So I bought my scape shifts for $7 a piece. Um, and I built the deck and I played it uh, for a long time as rug. And then when Bring the Light came out and that started getting popular, I had tried that out. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, the metagame just kind of shifted where I, I wasn't really feeling it anymore. So I, I switched over to Grixis and sold my scape shifts for like 40 bucks a piece. Right. Well, I mean, Dig Through Time was a key piece of that deck. It got banned. It kind of fell out of favor. And then oh, it took like. I forgot about Dig Through Time. So yeah, I was yeah. playing, I got a chance. I was already playing the deck when Dig Through Time sure. came out. And I was like, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> my well, deck's the it, best. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it was, it was like. Blue Red Delver. Blue Red. Blue yeah. Red Delver. With Young Pyromancer and stuff. Yeah, with Young Pyromancer. It was the Just Guy Ascendancy decks. It was Birthing Pod and it was Scape Shift. And those four decks kind of like just dominated. Yeah, it was just period. tier one because those were the, well, barring Birthing Pod. Yeah. Birthing Pod was just broken. Birthing Pod was just the best card <laughs> but in the, the other... before and after. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to play Death Rage Shaman. But the, the, um, those other decks were just the best Delve spell decks. Right. Jeskai Ascendancy and Delver were the best Treasure Cruise decks, and Scape Shift was the best Dig Through Time deck. Right. Because what I like about the blue versions of Scape Shift and what drew me to them is that they're like, they're basically a control deck with Scape Shift as your win condition. Correct. Yeah. So you're, um, so you're controlling the game. You're remanding their spells, buying yourself time. You're blocking with Secure Tribe Elder and sacrificing it to buy time. You're lightning bolting their creatures. You're, um, you know, eventually you're cryptic spells. commanding yeah. their spells. And you're, and Dig Through Time was just perfect because it drew you answers if you needed answers. And if you needed a win, drew you your win con. And sometimes it drew you both. Yep, you just dig through time. You're like, I'll grab a Roman and a cryptic command. Thank and you very much. You or a Roman and a uh, escape, shift. escape shift. Yep. Play escape shift. What do you got? <laughs> Normally nothing, or just their <laughs> own treasure crews, and then they went off with yeah. just guys and see, and ooh. <laughs> yeah, well, the romance uh, and the cryptics helped a lot there. So they banned, so, you know, Valakut's back, it gets to be one of the top decks in the format, and they banned Dick through time, knocking it back down, probably to tier two, tier three, and then it kind of exists, and then people start realizing at the same time that Bring the Light comes out, Bring the Light comes out, people are like, okay, now it's five color. But then at the same time, they're like, oh, we could just play red-green straight up because at the same time, they printed the la the second red-green dual land in the format. Cinderglade. So Cinderglade and Bring the Light come out in the same set. We talked about this in last week's episode where how this is how Battle for Zendikar really affected Modern is Scape Shift is one of the key pieces because it's split in the two decks. And, and red-green Scape Shift you know, Titan Shift decks have been a tier one deck in the format probably since then. And then- Yeah, and it was interesting. Yeah. The, the early versions of Titan Shift were a lot of times playing through the breach with Emrakul mm -hmm. um, because it was a powerful combo that people had already been playing in Modern and it seemed to fit well in the deck because through the breaching a Primeval Titan typically wins the game. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. People yeah. have dropped that nowadays, um, you know, I think due to the, maybe the speed of the format, I would guess. I think it's just a consistent it's too thing. Inconsistent. It's like it's a, if I'm able to cast this, I'm likely already able to cast Primeval Titan or I, or I won't have the pieces of Primeval Titan or, yeah. it, so there's like five dead cards in my deck if I don't have Primeval Titan or Emical in my hand. Yeah, I've never played Scape Shift without a ton of cantrips. So yeah. take my advice on Titan Shift with a little bit of a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what it is is just they realize these are dead cards, I'm already killing my opponent doing all the other things I'm doing. And I think Bloodbraid Elf just offered them that kind of aggressiveness that they needed while being more consistent of a card that drew them into yeah. the game plan they were already on. Um, Plus, because you're not drawing many cards in just the red-green deck, I mean, especially before Tireless Tracker, right. which this was, like, if you threw the Breach in Primeval Titan and you, like, get two Valakuts and you're, like, ready to attack and kill them and they're, like, Path to Exile, now you've two for one to yourself and right. you probably don't have much left in hand. Correct. <laughs> so that, that's, it definitely kind of, like, put you in a position where you would get close and then you would stall out versus now where I think they just add more powerful things to also be doing yeah. that let, help you out. 
Um, the new lists are, you know, and then, but on the other end, bring to light decks, which are these five color monstrosities. And that's what I did. It was the closest to what I was already playing. You still get to play Snapcaster and Cryptic Command and Remand All and the like blue. the blue yeah. core of the deck that drew me to it. Um, but now you also get to play stuff like Wrath the God and you get to play stuff like Fatal Push and you get to play stuff like, uh, what's the thing that gets you an Empyrean? Oh yes, Madcap Experiment out of the sideboard. So I was off the deck at this point, but I did a little bit of research before the episode and also just to check in on my old pet deck. And, um, and yeah, Madcap Experiment out of the sideboard seems really great. I had been playing three Inferno Titans in my sideboard, which took up a lot of space because post-board in the blue version of Scapeshift, you're playing uh, you know, six or seven creatures. You're playing four mm -hmm. Scourge High Belders and like two or three Snapcasters. Sure. And that's the only creatures in your deck. So Which your opponent is... Creature removal is bad because Sacro Tribe Elders are terrible to try and point a removal spell at and... And if you want to remove my Snapcaster, that's fine. Yeah. I don't care. It already <laughs> did its job, right? I mean, I'm not beating down with them in the deck because right. I'm dealing, you know, 20... Uh, so for the record, I did actually also have the Scape Shift deck. I built it during the... Um, the the dig through time era it was the deck okay. i moved to during all that right, era right. i like did that and birthing pod and then birthing both of them got banned on it was a bad, sad time for me <laughs> we well, uh, kept playing scape shift i did yeah I, I still have it built it's still sleeved up i never bought the port scape shift though so i never took that to a tournament but i was well, like, on my way cheap. and then i slowed down <laughs> um but scape shift was you know the amount of times i've beaten down my opponents with just snapcaster mage and bolts because snapcaster mage and bolts can just do that yeah and you can tap their creatures with cryptic it, it's happened to me too especially when they have blood moon and you're like well i can spend my time removing this blood moon or i can spend my time killing them right. but it's rare i like mean I like, like seven damage to you with the snapcaster mage by itself and then you already dealt five damage to you because that's how this game works and i'll just bolt and snap you for the, rest of the game it's just like yeah. the game plan i've done in my life. yeah it's true i i mean that that happens and i've actually beaten people down with sakura tribe elder too oh, yeah. not not from 20 to zero but i I've dealt six damage to them with the Sakura Tribe and the rest with the Snapcaster right. and, one and the Bolt. The, you know, one of the key things that you need to know with Cape Shift is that, you know, it doesn't... To get to higher than 20 actual damage takes an entire extra turn of effort, but you can do 18 damage pretty quickly. And yes, so, if you have seven lands in play, uh, unless you're playing Prismatic Omen, which makes the math interesting, but I was not playing Prismatic Omen because right. I was a more controlling deck. I couldn't afford to draw dead cards like that. So... Um, it, with seven lands, you get one Valakai and six mountains, and for each mountain you control, if you control five other mountains, which you do, because mm -hmm. you've got six, uh, then you deal... Three damage. They each, each mountain deals three, so, so then you... 18. 18. And so it generally behooves you, especially if your opponents know what they're doing and are not fetching for you know doing damage or keeping themselves over 18, to attack with the second type. Well, what's nice is if they're getting tapped lands, they're giving you so much time to just draw that right. extra land and then right. get two Valakuts right. and six right. mountains, at which point you deal 36 damage to them and they're super dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, so yeah. uh, you know, in matchups like Pod at the time, it was a big problem because they knew they needed to gain life and they had the tools to do it. Yep. So they would fetch Shock, they would play all their cards on time, they'd pay life for Birthing Pod, but they're like Kitchen Finks. Sack Kitchen Finks to Birthing Pod. Play Restoration Angel on Kitchen Finks. Sack it to Birthing Pod again. And you're like, <laughs> oh my God, what's your life total again? <laughs> well, and they're beating like, you up while they do and this. And they have food too, so they're just like, yeah. and I'm going to eat all the creatures I just killed. <laughs> yeah. I love Birthing Pod. R.I.P. R.I.P. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of the skip shift. Uh, before we kind of end the episode, uh, what would you say right now in today's metagame are some of the for Bring the Light Scape Shift, because that's the one that you have the most familiar with paying, and I think Red Green Scape Shift is a little bit more cemented in the format anyways. What matchups are the worst for Red, uh, Bring the Light Scape Shift, and which ones do you think are the best of like the top tier decks? So I haven't played Scape Shift against the top tier decks currently, so I'm just, this is all conjecture based sure. on my experience with the deck previously. So at the time, my biggest, the biggest problem for the deck was Liliana, um, which luckily is not getting played nearly yeah, as much gone. now. Um, and in fact, Deathrite Shaman into turn two Liliana was literally unbeatable. I would just scoop it up. Right. I mean, it's, I'm not going to beat that. But uh, because you're kind of a slower controlling deck, but you're also not playing many creatures, you don't really have a way to pressure Liliana. So she just pluses, pluses, pluses. You've got mm -hmm. no hand. So like, what ends up happening is you either have to discard your counter spells which leaves you vulnerable to just getting killed mm -hmm. or you have to discard your lands and discarding your lands is just as bad because you have to hit seven if you're right. going to kill them or lands or ramp spells which ramp spells are just lands that come into play quicker right yeah. um so liliana was a big problem so so now i think the big problems for the deck are going to be um like humans mm -hmm. uh, because they have like similar disruptive elements like thalia and kite sail freebooter right. that are like and meddling mage that are slowing you down and keeping you off your combo oh yeah i mean uh, a meddling mage 
into a Kitesail Freebooter or just another meddling mage seems unbeatable. Like if you call Bolt and Scapeshift, I don't well, know. That's unbeatable against a lot of decks. Yeah, but, yeah. but I mean, humans, one of the things that makes it so powerful is like typically aggro decks have a poor matchup against combo decks because they're able to... Um, Ignore you until the very last minute and then win out from under you. Right. A lot of times the combo decks will be faster than the aggro decks. And the aggro decks, in order to be aggressive, are shaving disruptive elements sure. like counter spells and thought seizes and things like that. And even if they have one counter spell or one thought seize, they, they don't have enough to stop you because you built a consistent combo deck, right? I mean, uh, but humans is not that. Humans has all the disruptive elements right there and they're all attacking you. <laughs> so, so I could see that being a big problem for the deck. One thing that's nice is with Bring to Light, you, you're typically playing a lot of one ofs. Right, mm -hmm. uh, it, both in the main and in the sideboard. So at the time that I was playing it, I had a Maelstrom Pulse, which can kill, you know, meddling, meddling mages, yeah. uh, or just one, which is probably what you need to do. Right. Uh, <laughs> I, ha I was playing one Damnation, uh, which is great. I was playing two Anger of the Gods, and then in the sideboard, I believe I had another Sweeper. I don't remember. It might have been a second Damnation. Supreme Verdict? Are you no, I was not playing white. I was playing black was my other color. Oh, okay. And you'll draw the cards sometimes, yeah, and if you yeah. draw a Damnation and it's just dead because you don't have black mana, it's rough. Yeah, or a Supreme yeah. Verdict and you don't right. have white. Um, I am seeing some of the ty some of the Bring to Light Skate shows playing white for Supreme Verdict because yeah, they think it's, it's that much better than Damnation. I also think the like it's a lot easier to cast one white mana off of a Supreme Verdict than it is to cast two black. Supreme Verdict costs white, white, blue, one. White, white, blue, one. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it does. Ignore me. <laughs> they, they, they typically make uh, unconditional sweepers cost double color, so yeah, that you yeah. have to be committed to a color. Right. You can't just be splashing yeah. Wrath of God into whatever you want. Um, but yeah, so uh, so you already have the diversity of sweepers that you're seeing control decks playing now because they know that they need different sweepers to beat Meddling Mage mm -hmm. because you can't just have them play Meddling Mage on Anger of the Gods. You lose, haha. -ha. Like, you have to. <laughs> Is Path also just better in the, the Bring the Light decks than Fatal Push from the perspective that you can sometimes just path your own Snapcaster Mage to ramp? That's true. That's very good, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can't say I didn't play it, but it sounds good. Yeah. Pathing your own Snapcaster is definitely something I would have been interested in. Right. I mean, it just makes Snapcaster Mage into like a, the like. The eight, the five through eight, uh, and also exiling order. is very relevant yeah. in, in this. Well, I mean, path is obviously in this metagame of Culligan's commands and things. I mean, I generally believe that path is the best removal spell in modern. Yeah, I mean, Bolt might be it, but like Bolt and Fatal Push definitely compete more. And path just like you need to kill something, it, it's dead. I mean, the problem is that white is not the best color, so you have that kind of dichotomy. And white it yeah. is the best white card in modern history. Yeah, so I think humans as like an aggro deck that specifically plays preys on combo decks would obviously be a problem because sure. you are a combo deck and you need all these different cards yeah. to operate. And if they get meddling maged or kite sail freebooted or thalia or whatever, then you you're sad. Right, your deck is um, also all spells, so just having four thalias out in front of you is like yeah, it's pretty annoying. Um, and then. Another deck I could I could potentially see having problems with is Hollow One because being a combo deck, those Goblin Lores and um, Burning Inquiries mm -hmm. are going to be a big pain in your butt. Now you can get lucky and beat them for sure because Sakura Tribe Elder is very good against Hollow One um, because it, it does exactly what you need. You play it on turn two. They probably have a Hollow One or Gurmag Angler or something ridiculous in play, but you just block it and sack, and right. then you get a land, and now you're ahead. You yeah. know, like they haven't damaged you. You like Sakura Tribe Elder against Hollow One almost feels like time walk I feel right. like <laughs> and that's great but the problem is that you do need to assemble like some disruptive elements in order to stop them from winning mm -hmm. because unlike Titan Shift which is all in on ramp cards and Primeval Titan to just win as quickly as possible you need a little bit more time but you're playing Remands and Cryptics and Bolts and things like that to give you the time that you need right um, and and uh, Burning Inquiry can definitely like get rid of your disruptive elements. You draw a ramp, or it can get rid of your ramp. You draw all disruptive elements, but you can't play them fast enough. Um, so I could see that deck being a problem just because of the random discards uh, being a problem for combo decks. Sure. Um, but other than that, I think I think against a lot of mid range decks, uh, Scape Shift's got game. The blue version in particular, because you between Bring to Light and uh, Blood Moon can be a bit of a problem because your mana base is kind of loose when you're playing four colors sure. with a ton of mountains and battle cuts in your deck. Yep. <laughs> but you you have Bring to Light and you have like other 
We also uh, like main deck and sideboard options to beat a Blood Moon. And mm -hmm. if you can beat the Blood Moon, Mardu Pyromancer just doesn't present enough of a clock to beat you. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless they're playing like Liliana or something, which well, they're I, not I think, usually. I even imagine like against Blue White Red decks, you have a little bit of a favorite position because you are playing counter magic and you're like protecting yes, you, your thing versus them just trying to stop you. Your deck is your good thing. against control, yes. And you, you just can, win the counter wars because you have all of the romance. Yeah, especially post board, you get like negates or swan songs or yeah. whatever, whatever your counter spells and your sideboard of choice are, dispels. Um, and just being able to like have more mana is so relevant. Right. Like, you know, mana leak and remand have fallen off, uh, but that means all counter spells have fallen off, which is good for yeah. a slower slower deck yeah. like this. But I mean, at the time that I was playing it, remand and mana leak were really good, and you were so good against them because you always have so much mana. You're like, oh, you remanded yeah. my scape shift? I'm gonna play well, it like, again. Like, what do you remand think? Is, <laughs> remand is insane against the Dell counter spell, so like. Yeah, against Logic Knot. Yeah, Logic Knot. And you're like, playing Romance. Yeah. It's and it's insane. great against Skirmag Angler, yeah. too, actually. Yeah, and yeah. It's, to an extent, Hollow One. Yep. You got to have it right, right then and there on turn it. two, and you have to not discard it, but. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think I think that's kind of it for today's episode. Those are kind of your good and bad matchups. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening on the live stream. Sorry for some of the difficulty we had at the beginning. Uh, you can check this episode with good recorded audio on YouTube at the end of this week. We're also releasing a bunch of other content on our YouTube channel, so check it out. And also check out the podcast app or collective.company to see these videos, but also the super secret blue black demure episode that like <laughs> oh that's funny it's a secret demir episode yeah, i like that yeah so that was all it on wasn't purpose. on purpose though i mean was it wait maybe <laughs> all right so does it exist uh we don't know but yeah so thanks for watching make sure to follow us i'm at uh cast wiley he you can find on me on the, the Masters Facebook of Modern group. Facebook group is the best place to find me, but I, I'm around. And we are at the MM Cast, and make sure to check out Battle Bosses. Once again, we designed it. It's the best game that's coming out. You can buy it August 14th on Kickstarter. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you guys next week. Bye.